Now, um, so what metadata you want to extract comes from that, right? And you need to know. Remember, uh, starting out, we start out with uh, we start out with keyword entities relationships. You need to know entity and entity type before you can start thinking about relationship. If it's two fluid house or body fluid, the relationship types that are relevant are different than two fluid house of medication. Right? What that tells you? That it builds upon. First, we do pattern recognition. We recognize patterns, which is closer to keywords. I'm talking about basic patterns. Like you have an image, an image has you know has some object, and we recognize that, and it comes as part of our human perception, perceptual aspect. Of it. Then we say, but that image is a um, an apple, or that image is something else. Is an apple fruit or apple logo of apple ink? Then we'll start thinking about the association. Apple, ah, maker of iPad, iOS, iTunes, Apple stock, most expensive, you know, most expensive company, you know, in the in, in, in the world, company with the highest valuation world. All these things come in the context. The trailblazing thing we talked about, Benoit Bruce, right? So relationships emanate from them. And they are contextual, you know, so, so they, they all are relevant. So then if I'm developing an intelligence system, the, the number of relationships are always far larger than the number of entities, right? Not necessarily types of relationship, but raw relationship, right? Because they're edges. Edges are always a lot more than nodes, right? So then if you want to develop a scalable solution, I don't afford to keep all the relations in memory. So I want to be able to load them in context when they need to. You see? So this shows, uh, uh, you know, extraction. I won't go into detail here. Um, here is a totally different kind of text. Right? So this is a text, uh, you know, that uh, this is a file. Uh, that comes out from mass spectroscopy. You guys know what is mass spectroscopy? Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, you know, you take uh, biological material, it's a cellular material, and then this thing will kind of, uh, you know, create spectrum, create, uh, you know, uh, and then uh, the ultimate idea is, for example, from this uh, cellular thing, how much Protein enzymes, proteins there are, enzymes there are, some of those low level of things. Then you can go to other things like DNA and other There is a similar thing where they find the elements in a particular uh, medium or something that is spectroscopy. They find what elements are there. Right, so mass spectroscopy is a type of spectroscopy. Yeah. And there are, art, you know, PCR and RT PCR, and these are all various machines. Some of them, you know, use, um, you know, centrifuge. Break apart the material and the very small fragment, and then you're able to, uh, you know, um, because you can't really wait uh, using like traditional weights, you have to wait using uh, spectrum and other things of that nature, right? So, this will be a file for coming from aspects of so proceed. And in this case, now you see you're going to start all these are all these things. So, these are what are these? What do they stand for? So, fragment ion mass over Z, I forgot now exactly what that stands for. Fragment ion abundance, peak list data. So there are different components here, and this is what we call a semantic annotation. Right? Here, you are you know talking about um, a video data, and there are broad variety of video data. So um, you can see here there is a technique. Who is trying it? How it works, 
whether wired meaning is it works or not, and tired meaning it is now getting outdated. Right? So identify what is being shown. So statistical, visual, computer like video mining, or algorithms try to figure out what is in the video by monitoring attributes like behavior and movement, faces and objects. And finds friends, public figures, specific actions like car chases. And the te technology is stuck in the lab. Now this is of course very old slide. But I'm just trying to tell you that you know the metadata you know, is a very important component. In this case, and this is a very interesting slide, I want you to pay attention to just one aspect. That this is a document, right? And uh, there is an actual document and there is this uh, semi-structured data associated with the document after you have done annotations. Now what is happening, you see, is that part of this document gets annotated with domain ontology, like company in person, other parts gets annotated with spatial ontology. Another part gets annotated with temporal ontology. Right? So, um, yeah, you know, there are different aspects of it, and this shows you one document are getting annotated by multiple ontologies. Each ontology has entity types, relationship types, and hence you can, once you have, I noted there, I can go, you know, so they, once I have the name of the author, then I can say, oh, what genre of, uh, you, know, you know, novels this author writes? Action, or whatever, right? So this kind of knowledge you can bring to bear. So there's some early work on relationship there. I already talked to you about metadata reference leak, so we talked about this earlier. If you have a question, let me know, but we discussed it before. Then, we are talking about complex relationship. So, um, uh, relationship are not always simple, okay? And then, you know, example of complex relationship includes paths between classes and associations. So, uh, I ask you to read a few things on Association, graph fitting function, right, or form functions. Uh, you remember um, the uh, example of uh, nuclear test creates earthquake? Right? We discussed that, right? And so we got the data. Now I want to represent that data, you know, uh, we, we, uh, I made a statement that above, uh, there doesn't seem to be any relationship between earthquakes, uh, you know, between nuclear tests and earthquakes that are large earthquakes, meaning one above seven. Uh, Android on Richter scale. Okay. And then we say, well, there are, you know, this kind of potential co co-occurrences happening. Now, when you put that graph, you can fit that in a form-fitting function and then have something that you can apply, right? So that function becomes basically the relationship that ties nuclear tests with earthquakes. Or it ties um, a tsunami uh, you know, earthquake tsunami, right? There are probabilistic relational model, and you know, so this is, uh, I think I, we already talked about it, smoking okay, causes this cancer. We had this experiment. Yeah, so we have done this slide before already. Okay. Then, I want to show you this one here. So, um, uh, and I will have another slide for this later on. But in this case, we have a broad variety of documents. Okay. And you have concepts like Reynolds, disease, and fish oil. And then you have knowledge coming from UMLS. So, the process of creating a hypothesis and validating it becomes possible or easier when you are able to extract data, metadata, and knowledge. They all come together. If you don't have this, it's possible that there's not enough information and data to make associations between the metadata. And hence, you can't, you know, at the end of the day, Free shower is of no interest really to human in this particular case unless it is something to do with disease right? management. So, um, so there's this um, 
work uh, that uh, one of my students did, uh, schema-driven extraction relationship from biomedical text. Um, now, so this is a very interesting example. Look at this sentence. And uh, this should really interest uh, Shweta. What is the relationship here? Estrogen uh, induces and terminates hypoplasia. Okay, between estrogen and adenomatous hypoplasia, and also between endometrial hypoplasia and endometria. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. So, estrogen is sentient, right? That's something, right? Endometrial. That whole thing is a simulation. <laughs> that whole thing, okay? There's no subset of that is meaningful. Pay attention. Hyperpreserve endometrium, that whole thing. Endometrium by itself is meaningless here for this year, not relevant. If you do that, you got nothing. It is hype. Adnometrous hyperplasia of endometrium. That, is, that as a whole. And what happened? So, that whole thing induces that whole thing, is what we need to figure out. So, we, we should capture, uh, okay. so we should capture the whole thing from N excessive endogenous or exogenous by estrogen. Because, uh, yeah, I looked into this thing that, okay, estrogen and uh, adenomatous hyperplasia is two different entity and actually I, I just know the estrogen, I don't know the other term, uh, but... From, Which one? I can explain it. <laughs> yeah, that is biomedical thing. But I just figured it out that, okay, these two might be entity because of the term induces. So it is a kind of a relationship. Yeah, induces is a relationship yeah. by all means. Yeah. So between these two terms, estrogen and endometrials. But... Uh, no, the, this sentence, mm -hmm. uh, you know, really not talking about, it's just not talking about estrogen. Yeah, and, the whole, the, the, that's In what fact, it is the estrogen that gives you the uh, stimulation. So I think and the stimulation is of, uh, you know, so excessive endogenous, endogenous or exogenous stimulation by estrogen. You know, so if you, uh, uh, you know, any part of that is just not the entity you're talking about. Hmm. Actually, there are two events here. First mm -hmm. event is the stimulation by estrogen induces the adenomatous hypoplasia. The adenomatous hypoplasia of endometrium is the second event. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into this, uh, all the details, but, um, you know, when you do this, this is, um, uh, you create a uh, pass tree, and how do you break, you know, the uh, pass tree and try to identify the complex entity. So that was basically Kartik's work. And then, you know, this was in this case to find R associated, it's just, you know, is a relationship, right? Between this whole thing and this whole thing. And to try and, you know, and then how do you, you know, appropriately break the sentences and make sense out of that is, is, a, is a challenge that he's talking about. And then here's an experiment and how much how accurate his um, work was. So he's trying to find out, as you can see, modifiers, modified entities, and composite entities. So you see here modifiers, then you see here modified entities, right? So you can see it. Modi Adnomatous is modifier of hyperplasia and, uh, you know, of estrogen, uh, and, sorry, with estrogen. And then this whole thing is for the composite entity. And that is how it, you know, gets that. Now this thing we have done before, so I'm going to bypass. Okay. 
So finally, this again coming back. I think there's a duplicate here for what reason I don't understand. So you know, it's, it's this whole network there. I won't go into this detail. It's pretty a lot of NLP work going on there. But just something to understand. Now here is another very interesting example of a complex relationship. How are Harry Potter and ah, look at this one? <laughs> How are Harry Potter and Dan Brown related? And so this is a discovery that again Kartik, the, you know, Kartik, Kartik did. So you have this all these different things. Harry Potter's book, Dan Brown's book. There is a um, there is a painting called um, At in Arcadia Go. And then there is a painting, Santa Maria della Grazia. Okay. And then what happens is that you get different metadata from Harry Potter because in Harry Potter he mentioned, you know, um, Nicholas Flemmer is mentioned in Harry Potter and uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame is mentioned in Harry Potter. Dan Brown, Victor, you know, uh, this one, uh, what is it? It's written by Victor Hugo. Uh, this is painted by Nicholas Possa and uh, it's at Lou and so on and so forth. Right? So these are different media, right? And then you will see that there are so there are all these different metadata coming from different sources. See, there's Last Supper, that's the painting of Last Supper, right? And then what happens is there happens to be a table somewhere where the table list all the that there is to be a so-called secret group of priority of science. and that has all these guys Nicholas Fermel, Victor Hugo, Leonardo Vinci as members. So that connects the whole thing, right? And that connection then enables, uh, uh, you know, uh, people to make this, you know, answer this question. I won't talk about these things again. There's a lot of things in biomedical relationship extraction. case uh, there's a very different perspective and you know so you have uh, they have different data items and then you have metadata so here this this thing works with that this thing is directed by that this is produced by that see that cross up with the data the instance level to make sense of that you would use schema so these are all sports related things plays in these guys are business related things here, phones, and these are entertainment schema directed by all that, right? And so in many of the real world things, you have to bring all these things together. Here there is one of what we did about um, how do you find this connection when you have so much metadata out there. So in this case, uh, this algorithm kind of grows from one step S and T to Next thing is, and, and there is an how do you efficiently uh, build, uh, you know, the you know, find a path within this S and T is, is is a topic. I'm not going to talk about that in general. So we had a demo in this case, for example, which is an interesting thing. How is uh, Bill Clinton associated with John McCain? Both of them are different parties, right? But like, they may be like they were together in a uh, an organization that. Um, uh, you know, so they were, they, they were, they gave a talk at the same place on, you know, symposium or things of that nature. But then when you try to, for example, say, uh, let's say that uh, uh, there is an insider training in stock. Then you want to find out, could this person have passed on the stock tick to this person? And then you need to find out, well, where could they have met? How could they be associated? So when you want to try to find this kind of stuff out, you are trying to do noise discovery. And this is that example of the kind of stuff. 
So this example, for example, in, in this case, um, you know, there is this, um, let's say, a form to open a bank account. And then there is a name of some person. And then you see that there are all these um, uh, stuff on top. These are on world model ontology. So organizations watch list, FBI watch list. And this is some other kind of, you know, schemas. And in this case, you know, then you have, you start making connections. Right? So you can see you are making semantic association. Right? So it's something like this that uh, that guy appears in on FBA watch list, works for a company, work on, is that is member of organization Hamas. Similarly, there is investment banking kind of stuff. And you can see a whole bunch of different data item, databases and so on and so forth. And you're making connections. So uh, this in this case, Wojtek Morawski is related to uh, Rabina Trust, and Rabina Trust appears on FBI watch list. This is example of semantic relationship. Right? This is in fact what is called as know your customer application. Every bank has to have. And this is where the first financial service applications were built on the top of the C-Magic Freedom, which we discussed before. Right? Now, imagine that you want to build this thing without using any semantic approach. See, here is the thing. That person is related to a bit at us, or that appears on. These are relationships, right? Understanding this relationship directly from data, using whatever you want to use, any pattern identification, that's very, very hard. You really have to have a model that has relations like appears in, related to. Right? Here, um, um, it's a re recreation of what is called as uh, um, uh, mm. discovering public knowledge. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, the, you know, there is a guy named, um, what is his name? Um, Kiss my mind. Um, in 1989, what he did was to go through manually go through biomedical literature, and he made something like 11 discoveries. One of the discoveries was this one: that magnesium is used to manage migraine. He discovered that. And what we wanted to do is that he did manually going through the literature. Can we create? In automated or semi-automated way, because since the time of 1987 or whatever he did this thing, Swanson, yeah, his name is Bill Swanson. At that time, the number of biomedical literature, you know, amount of biomedical was much smaller than now. It's way, in fact, uh, five six years ago when I was looking at it, it's already 20 million PubMed articles and abstracts. And it's growing very fast. Every in the, in, five six years ago, every year there were three million more, but now there's more. So you have all that data, but not only you have article, but you have some databases out there. Curated data. And you have your clinical data. Your social data. All of this needs to can be exploited to continue to do find new things like that, new association. In this case, from this document you get that. From this document you get that. And from this document you get that. Or this you get that and this you get that. You see? So different piece of talk in, 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 in Swanson's work, he got different pieces of information from different data sets or different uh, publications, literatures, and he put them together. Now this is not very easy because you you can't connect just like Avery, it has to be connected in context. So it's not as easy as it seems. This is the work that also then uh, Delroy started working on initially. It's called undiscovered public knowledge. 
Then uh, we built this semantic browser. This was done a long time ago. It was very interesting, I think, story. Um, I think it was this. Uh, so one student worked on this thing when I was in Georgia. And he had a thesis. Seven years later, somebody found his thesis and uh, called him for interview. And then he joined that company. So, um, uh, uh, you know, here, you see all these are annotated data. And so they are, you know, connected. This is class of uh, neoplasm metastasis, right? And, and and then for you know, so here neoplastic process. That class, so this entity is a class of that it belongs to that class. It's a member of that class. That class has participated in all these relationships. So neoplastic, then degree of, and then experimental model of disease. So person is creating a tray, set of relationships. And behind the scene, as you, person is trying to browse this, our system gives them documents that match any sentences that instantiate any of these relationships, or these concepts. So what happened, what's happening? Now, not every trail base would have supporting documents. So if you don't have it, that means that it's not validated on the data. But if you find it, that means, oh, you found a new discovery. So Kartik and I had this paper on relationship web. Here, um, you know, there's this document here, and here you can see that on that document you can find spatial, temporal, and thematic elements, right? You can see Best Buy, Fifth Avenue in 44th Street, Spatial, New York, uh, thematic, uh, Hello 3. So, we are able to create, um, you know, you know, many, there, there are many relationship types. You are able to extract them, what events, and then once you can do that, you can answer questions like, what events happen near this event? What entities and organizations are, are related to, uh, are located nearby? What events happen before or after during this event? You know, and things like that. And many of these things. So by, you know, having richer type of um, metadata, you can uh, do interesting analysis of data. What can we do here further? What can we use? Um, and uh, here is a good example. So here you have a sensor data. Uh, one very uh, you know this big area of investigation called sensor data fusion and then, and then analysis. So uh, there is a high level sensor like drone or something, and that gives you this picture. There is a roadside sensor, a sensor on the road that gives you this picture. Low level sensors like on the uh, you know traffic lights. How do I say that this object is same as that? Now, how do you even, you know, even, you know, how do, how do I even assert that, right? So, how do I determine if A, 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 A is the same? So, it requires, that, oh, first, you know, is this for the same time? Is this for the same place? So in this particular case, in sensor case, you have raw or phenomenological data, your feature metadata, your entity metadata, your relational metadata. Right. And so here you can see a, a data architecture, your data of all these two kinds. Your space ontology, your objective and ontologies, these are ontologies. And you have, you know, this architecture, BIKW, uh, uh, architecture of raw data, phenomenological data, feature metadata, entity data, province, pathways, spatial temporal association, object event relationship. And in this particular case, what we are showing is, uh, these are something coming from sensor web enablement 
uh, standard that uh, uh, that the OGC, one of the you know agencies, have developed. Right? So this is a this is an international standard for marking up the data of different kind, and then we are showing you how you can utilize that. So let me see. Matt, Matthew Perry uh, now works at Oracle. In fact, he is a key player in Oracle's support for RDF and then spatial data. So he is developer also of uh, one of the recent standards from the 3 c unit involving spatial data. And uh, so he did this work here. Um, and uh, you know there are different semantics on uh, when you deal with location and spatial information. So there's modeling of that. I'm not going to talk too much about it, just kind of give you a very high level idea. So um, for example, here you can see the data on the bottom and uh, upper level ontology on the uh, top. And the ontology has location ontology and time ontology, spatial temporal. And the questions you need to ask is, could these uh, soldiers have been um, exposed to Agent Orange? to you know this thing in battlefield chemicals in battlefield right these are the kind of questions you want to ask so then you have to you know then he goes through a lot of analysis and does this in a semantic web in a shows how semantic web framework is a is a better way to solve this problem compared to say relation or other way so I won't go into details of that but so spatial temple thematic query as you say SCT query so you develop a mechanism uh, so you can ask the question about chemical induces, uh, you know, when the uh, soldiers fought in the same war, in the same, you know, they belong to the same platoon or whatever, you know, military uh, group maybe and so on and so forth. Okay. So, uh, to end up, uh, there's another interesting just way of looking at it. So you have the web and all kinds of web related technologies. You have social software. You have semantic web. And then, you know, this is somebody introduced this term meta web. It's from uh, Nova Spiller. And so the semantic and social come together. There are, there are many words that are used for talking about the same kind of stuff. You also here's an interesting thing you have formal you know modeling like out you have a lot of implicit metadata and st you know statistical and machine learning kind of thing in the web domain and you have a lot of social information and then they are all you know, supported to a powerful or powerful solution. So this is a um, you know view of um, let me give you some more little tidbit and then we you know, can end. So, So um, here's another talk, uh, trailblazing complex hypothesis relation, abductive reasoning, and semantic web. Um, it's nice that I, I know this very nice uh, diagram. Right? You know, fire hose of data, and then you know, give me something I can use. I think you've seen this, right? Object by country. You have seen this. Okay. Make sure you can define what is semantics to somebody who is not, you know. You guys know this? Ontology, semantic calculation, reasoning. We have a lot of work on ontologies. We also did a lot of work with this thing. You guys know this. Here is a uh, healthcare data. This is for our Alchemy for Health Group. 
and you can see with this one that I've shown here, except from the So um, this is an example. Um, let me just uh, so uh, we saw that. This has some details on that. I'm going to discuss this here. I'll discuss that guy. So what is a good path with respect to knowledge discovery? Should you use a more specific class of relationship, employee versus assistant professor? Uh, uh, should you use rarer facts, analogous to information gain? Uh, should you look for um, uh, unexpected connections? So connects entity with different domains, that would be unexpected. So, um, Based on this, then we develop some algorithms, and uh, and I do uh, this slide I showed. So, how do you effectively analyze symmetric associations in that? And then uh, you are trying to find, you trying to do a better search versus you trying to find discover new things, unusual things here, yeah, right? So this is where came up for some sort of self rank uh, you know, paper came in. Okay. And, you know, this was an interface to her um, thing. So what she could do was to tell you, so she has defined a entropy-based function and say whether you want the results conventional search, so a lot of things of the kind related or exceptionally related things here. So you can choose how you want to look for relationship in the data. Relationship, yeah? uh, semantic association. So this is, oh, this is, this is a better slide, but uh, I will talk to you about that. Just clean the slide. And here, here, by the way, a little more detail of that. So, see, there were all these different documents, right? All these different data is there. And somehow from all the data, you need to find this. So what did we have? We started with, uh, you know, Wikipedia page on uh, DaVinci Code. And we, you can see all those entities that were recognized there. And, and so you can see in this, this, those things are instantiated. Then we found this other page. where you have this, you know, last supper, and you find a bunch of entities associated with that, and you associate them, then you found this table, and you, you know, those are the entities, and then you associate, you put them there, And then you connected all of them. So um, you, you know this. This is just showing you the idea. In reality, you know, doing all these things on some you know given large amount of data of different kinds from different sources is not easy. But you know what? What? What you need to reflect is now. You need to ask some of the basic things. What you learn in information retrieval. Who has done course on information here? And you know, um, you could say, how do I find relevant document? Right? That's a fundamental question in information data, right? And then you start comparing those kind of techniques that we have had versus what you are seeing here in semantic kind of driven techniques, where you have um, semantic uh, so some semantic knowledge, knowledge representation or knowledge. Uh, ontologies, you have things semantic annotations, 
and then you have uh, also modeling of relationships and then you have relationships versus the entities and then you have you know things connected through relationships and that are you know there are important discoveries or important findings from the data right? and what is happening now is that we made we started to make that progress we started with you know old search engines where uh, there was only information retrieval based engine like alta vista right then came um, a little bit of uh, you know intelligent thing called base rank for ranking the things better and using social uh, you know information to give high ranking social information in the sense that if many pages are pointing to that page then that page is highly ranked right so you use that then you know after a lot of innovations happened there then you know browsing is and all those things happen then came knowledge graph and now you're doing entities things and what I showed you is lot other things that go well beyond the current state of the art of the big you know search engines like you know Bing or uh, Google, where you see this bigger role of relationships. Right? And for those of you, I also expose you to the concepts of um, you know implicit, formal, and powerful. So for those of you who instinctively learn uh, like uh, the statistical data processing and uh, machine learning should also see how they can uh, complement what they do by using uh, external knowledge, existing knowledge, factual knowledge out there and solve this question better, right? And the other way around, if you you, you, you worked only, only on the structured data and for some of our, uh, semi structured data, then you need to start thinking, uh, but how do you scale it against very large data sets and how can I use implicit uh, knowledge also in conjunction with what I already have? And then you can solve more and more complex problems. In the process today, um, you know, I also give you one example: sensor data. Uh, we looked at biomedical literature, kind of example. Some additional complexity there of complex entities we looked at. All these are all related issues, and hopefully you got some intuition on the role that knowledge plays, knowledge the modeling plays, um, uh, relationships plays, and such. Any questions here or questions discussion you want to have? Did you look at my message about in the class I think about uh, all the papers that came up for and others had, right? Any questions there? I of course you know put it only in morning, so I don't expect that you read any of the papers. But and it's unclear that you would have all time to read all those papers, but you do need to understand. Uh, you know, you need, you, you, this is a good example where you can step back and understand how uh, somebody does a body of work. In this case, how came up for did that? Mm -hmm. It was uh, 2002, and uh, we are in the lab, like our 366 room, and uh, and then I said, you know, this path, problem, you know, connections through relationship is very, you know, very interesting, and it gave us some examples. And then came up for, you know. Uh, sat down and defined the row operator, and then after the you know, 2000, so first paper was 2002, but then 2003 paper, and then um, uh, she did uh, you know this uh, uh, ranking paper, and then she says, how do I query all that data? This is the same you know uh, uh, 2007 uh, paper on the querying. Same rank 2005. Same rank is 2005. Yeah. In parallel, another student they took different approach. Eleven Meza, I also given his papers, and so he had a less formal approach, and uh, he also did also very interesting. So the two guys who worked on that. But again, Kimo uh, Force was the first to work on that kind of topic here in the, this particular discipline. So I think her 2002 paper, which was a shorter version of 2003 paper, I have 100 to 200 citation, 2000 peak paper as 248, citation 2005, 2005 as 2,298 citations, today 2007 has 150 citations, very good, you know, track record. 